going to continue today with uh, morality. It's our topic. Okay. <clears throat> I just want you to uh, take out those sheets that we were using. Okay. Moral principles, okay. And you know, on the, on the front side of that page, where it says moral principles, um, under conscience, okay, or that, like the third paragraph under conscience, it's an act of the judgment of the intellect, okay, and that we, we guide our conscience or inform our conscience by the Ten Commandments, other teachings of mm -hmm. Scripture, and the teachings of the Church. Well. An important word there, just write it in, okay, is what do we call the teachings, the official teachings of the church, the teaching authority of the church? What do we call that? Kristen, what's the official teaching authority of the church? It's the mad magisterium. magisterium. That's, write that in. I mean, I'm assuming you realize this, but um, that's what I mean when I say we guide our actions by scripture and tradition and the teachings of the church, which comes through the teaching authority of the church. It's the magisterium, which is the living voice of Christ. And uh, if you want a, a catechism reference, uh, 1783, in fact, Anthony, would you give me a catechism? Give me one of those. I'll just read you what, what it says, because it's rather instructive. 1783, the Catechism of the Catholic Church um, says this. Actually, it's under, there's a whole section on moral conscience, okay, which you can look up. But here's 1783. Conscience must be informed and moral judgment enlightened. A well formed conscience is upright and truthful. It formulates its judgments according to reason in conformity with the true good willed by the wisdom of the Creator. The education of conscience is indispensable for human beings who are subjected to negative influences, like our modern day culture, for example, okay, and tempted by sin, ditto that, okay, to prefer their own judgment and to reject authoritative teachings, like. This, this is Pelosi and others who say, I'm going to follow my own conscience. Well, um, they're disobeying the teaching of the church, and that's a problem, especially when you're a public figure. Um, and I just wanted to elaborate on conscience a little more because it's so important. Um, we have a duty to inform our conscience. But okay, we can we can enlighten our conscience through through what? For example, Maddie, what, what can we look at to enlighten our conscience? For example, what can we look at? Back in the Catholic Church, excellent place. Okay, gee, I wonder what the church teaches. Just look it up. Okay, no one can claim ignorance anymore. You can get this. You can get online and plug in any word and get the answer. So, if you have if you don't have a clear understanding of what the catechism teaches, you just ask the priest, and we'll tell you what it means. Okay? If there's something that's really not clear, but the catechism is pretty, pretty clear. Um, that's to inform our conscience, but we can also, human beings can contribute to their own deadening of conscience. Conscience is a light that guides us. And if it's informed, then we know what's right and wrong. But the conscience, because we're human beings, it can be deadened. It can be blackened. And I'll give you a quote here from one of the great saints, St. Saint Augustine, the 
Hippo. Uh, and Augustine knew this well because Augustine was a bad boy. You know anything about St. Augustine? He was not a good guy. St. Augustine was uh, a brilliant. He was proud and arrogant and um, lecherous. You know what I mean by lecherous? He shacked up with a woman for years, had a child out of wedlock. His mother kept praying for him. He kept blowing her off. But she kept praying and praying and praying. And finally, Augustine turned his life around. But um, in fact, a bishop told St. Monica, because Augustine's mother is a saint, uh, your, your son is hopeless. Okay? Because he's so proud and arrogant, he's going to do his own thing. He's not going to listen to you. Well, Monica just kept praying and praying and praying. And another bishop, who happens to be a saint, Ambrose, he helped convert Augustine too, because Augustine heard his preaching. Augustine, um, Augustine had an internal struggle. Uh, he wrote a book about his own life, an autobiography. Anyone ever heard of it? It's called The Confessions of St. Augustine. He writes about his own life and the problems he had uh, embracing the faith. And he writes in his book, Confessions, that um, at one point in life he said, oh Lord, convert me, but not yet. I'm having too good of a time. Why am I in song and I'm enjoying the good life? So, you know, convert me, but later on. Well, he ended up converting and becoming one of the great saints in the church. And um, this is what St. Augustine said, okay? I write this down because this is worth repeating, okay? Every sin becomes trivial every sin becomes trivial with habit okay. with habit um, comma until you come treat it as practically nothing. And then he uses an example here. Callus, get on your hand, okay, uh, has already lost the sense of pain. St. Augustine. talking about here a deadened conscience, okay? a conscience that's dead to sin. The more you do sin, the more trivial it becomes until you come to treat it as practically nothing. A callus has already lost the sense of pain. You, know, you don't feel pain, you got that callus. This is how the conscience is, too. The conscience, okay, you, you one no longer, okay, has pangs of conscience, let's say, pangs or pricks, okay, or pricks, okay, a little, little needle prick, okay, or pricks of conscience. If one, if one repeats sin, okay, repeats a sin, 
this is we're talking about serious sins here, okay? So you put there Father Campbell, okay? 1957 to I'm not dead yet, so okay. So one no longer has pangs or pricks of conscience if one repeats a serious sin. Your conscience becomes dead after repeated sin. There are <clears throat> some examples of this. Can anyone think of an example of this? This, this principle here. Any figures? No? Um, addictions to different things? Oh, addiction is, um, you're talking about a physical addiction usually. And sometimes that is overcoming a person's ability even to choose. I'm not talking about addiction to you, but that's, that's a different class of, of sin. People choose to start it, but they may, they may fall into it and, and not intend it. Okay? Uh, but for the deadened conscience, if someone's repeating sins, can anyone think of an example where someone is really committing horrible sins and just doesn't think anything of it? Just you know, let those out as normal because of their repetition of the sin. And now the conscience is dead. So they'll, they'll even defend themselves. I can think of a couple of people. You've, you've heard of the Nazis, right? Uh, when people, when the Nazis were first putting people into the gas chambers, while they were having pangs of con conscience, of seeing people killed. But after they did it, maybe for the 20th time or 200th time, then it wasn't something that was bothering them. They probably couldn't sleep the first night they did it. But after they did it for you know, 50 or 100 times, they were doing it as if part of the normal part of life. I've heard former abortionists give testimony, saying that the first time they did an abortion, the doctor said he couldn't sleep at night before. He said after he did it, he went into the bathroom and puked. So he knew he was killing a baby. But after he performed his uh, maybe 500th or 1,000th, one doctor, 10,000, he estimates. Okay. Um, this is just part of a normal life. He was just performing the abortions and wasn't thinking about it because now it's just a habit and the light of conscience is no longer operating. And you need a miracle of grace then to get someone out of a, out of a habit of sin where they're really invested in sin and their conscience is deadened. Don't tell me I'm doing something wrong. You know, I'm just... Uh, Life goes on, and this is how I live. So, <clears throat> to get someone with a dead conscience to enlighten them is not an easy thing to do. It takes God's grace. We have to pray for sinners. That's where we come in. Because if, if, if they've rejected the ordinary avenues of grace that God makes available to them, then we have to pray for these people that they'll receive an extraordinary shot of grace to really wake them up and, and, and shock them, so to speak, back into uh, reality, back into their senses, so that their conscience begins working again. And they feel, they can feel guilt. And people with a dead conscience, they feel no guilt. I've heard hitmen for the mafia give testimonies. First person they killed, oh, they, it was horrible. They couldn't sleep. They, they you know, had all kinds of, of, of guilt problems. But by the time they were killing, you know, their their 50th or 100th person, it was you know like stepping on an ant. Human life, nothing. Okay. I just heard a testimony of. Uh, uh, do any of you at your churches have the Lighthouse series? We have it in St. Teresa and, and Mount Carmel. Uh, it's a, it's, you can get. Uh, CDs and listen to talks, and one of them is by a fellow who 
was, was in the British Mafia. And he says, I did horrible things, because I can't even tell you the things I did. And uh, he, he ended up converting. He tells his conversion story. Um, he says that when he confessed to a priest, finally, uh, the priest later told him, because usually priests, we don't remember people's sins. Because people, everyone says, you think your sins are, are unique, but they're not. The priests hear sins. And we never remember sins. But the priest told him, he said, you know, I usually don't remember when people confess to me, but I remember your confession. Because this guy was really, really bad. And he ended up converting to Christ, and now he goes around speaking. And um, He spoke at the Milwaukee's Men's Conference, the Men of Christ Conference a couple of years ago. Powerful witness. Um, but yeah, their conscience can become dead, and so what does this mean? You have no guilt, okay? No guilt. Guilt is a good thing. You should have a guilty conscience if you do something wrong, but once when, when somebody is repeating serious sin, ah, you know, the conscience becomes deadened. Like the Nazis who were putting people in, in the gas chambers. Um, how could someone do this? Has anyone seen 12 Years a Slave? If you haven't seen it, no, watch it. Run it. It's, it's, it's a good movie. Uh, it's a powerful movie about slavery. When you think, how could people treat other human beings like that? You know, um, like, like animals beat them, whip them, and uh, well, the conscience becomes dead. Any of us is capable of anything. Believe me, we are. We're no different than the Nazis and the southern, southern slave owners and the abortionists. All of us can fall into patterns of sin. So. Um, and I'll just mention uh, one sin in particular that, uh, well, a deadened conscience, no guilt, the, the intellect is, becomes darkened, okay? It's darkened, okay? The conscience, okay? The conscience is, 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 uh, is, is blackened, you could say, okay? And this comes about through repeated sin. Someone is, is in a habit of sinning, keeps sinning over and over again, uh, their, their conscience becomes darkened. Now, do you know who the greatest saint, the greatest intellect in the Catholic Church is? Okay. Intellect darkened, conscience blackened, okay, that's what we're talking about here. Um, in fact, I'll ask Nick because Nick, you just mentioned his name, the greatest intellect in the history of the Church is whom Pius V, Thomas Aquinas, okay? Thomas Aquinas is the greatest mind in the church. And Thomas Aquinas dealt with this. Kate issue. Mottingham, Fred Steinmetz, Zach Dutter, Jess, Jessica Weaver, please come to the main office immediately. Kate Mottingham, Fred Steinmetz, Zach Dutter, Jessica Weaver, please come to the main office immediately. St. Thomas Aquinas, okay? St. Thomas Aquinas, he, he, in his teaching, okay, says that um, you know, repeated sin will darken the intellect, but the sin that darkens the intellect most frequently okay, uh, that, you say, most, most frequently okay, darkens the intellect. And uh, uh, clouds the conscience, okay? Clouds one's conscience, okay? Conscience is, okay. take a guess. When people fall into this sin, it's like they lose sight of things and they don't see things clearly, and it's very difficult to get them out of a bad habit. Anyone guess what it is? Take a guess. Take a guess, Maddie. What do you think? Take a guess, Kate. Go ahead. Not murder. Not murder. No. 
No, it's it's committed most frequently. I mean, it's it's it's, it's a frequent sin that people struggle. What? Lies. Not lies, but begins with L. Lust. Lust. Okay. Lust. When people fall into sins of the flesh. Okay. Sins of the flesh, it tends to cloud their conscience. Um, why is that? Because, because uh, of the intense pleasure that pleasure okay, of the sin. Okay, I mean, you're you're really enjoying yourself with sins of lust, and it's it's difficult to extricate oneself from those types of sins, when people fall into patterns of sins. Um, it's very powerful. That's why, you know, pornography is, um, is, is very addictive. In fact, they say that pornography is, is as addictive as cocaine, it changes the brain patterns. Okay? Um, that's that's a physical thing going on too. But also, uh, just uh, you know, relationships. People uh, people will get into relationships and can't can't break them off because there's this this um, you know attraction and the pleasure that comes with these these sins. Uh, and here we're talking about sinful relationships, like, like adultery, okay? fornication, okay? sex before marriage, this is sex, while you're married. Okay? People become bonded to each other through the pleasure and the, the intensity of the, of the pleasure and, and you know, the, the good feelings involved. And it it's almost clouds people. They, they can't break away out of them. Uh, you know, Our Lady of Fatima, at Fatima, Portugal, in 1917, she said uh, that more people go to hell for sins of the flesh than for any other reason. She said that in 1917, where, when people were a lot more, society was a lot more pure and chaste. Um, not that it's the greatest sin. Lust isn't the greatest sin, but it's the sin that most people fall into. And... Out of out of all the sins, it's it's probably the one that that uh, well that's what our lady said. More people go to hell for, for sins of the flesh than for, than any other reason because of this this problem with uh, trying to to draw oneself out of a sinful relationship. It's very difficult. People people get uh, their 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 conscience becomes clouded, they, and and their their free will weakened. In particular, with sins of the flesh. So, um, Chase Mottinger, please come to the main office. Chase Mottinger, come to the main office. And, um, I want to uh, if you take a look at the back side of that sheet I handed out on moral principles. Um, just to review once again, three components to, to a moral action. And they all have to be good. The object, what it is that's being done, that's usually the most important thing, the guiding thing. You know, what is it that you're doing? And the act itself, what you're, being, what you're doing has to be good for it to be a moral act. There are some things that are intrinsically evil. You know what intrinsically evil means? It means that there's no, intrinsically evil means there, there's nothing that can change the evil nature of the act. Your intention or your motive or some justification. 
So, <clears throat> um, and oh, I did. I did write that under. Okay. Some acts, because of their, their of their object, are intrinsically evil. Always evil in themselves, no matter what circumstances or intention. Okay. Uh, we never justify an abortion, for example. You can't do it. But we'll save the mother's life. We'll, um, you know, this child may grow up you know, in a poor neighborhood. You know, Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, uh, Margaret Sanger, uh, she wanted to get rid of the blacks. She said, we'll use the black ministers to, to get rid of these blacks and also the feeble-minded, she said, you know, get rid of these people. Don't let them reproduce and abort them. That's why Planned Parenthood has most of their clinics, abortion clinics, in, in black and Hispanic neighborhoods. Okay, if, you, if you want to know the truth about it. Okay. So the object has to be good. The circumstances surrounding the act um, can, can make it a different act sinful. They can't justify something that's that's inherently evil, though. Well, a woman might die if, if she doesn't have an abortion. Well, we're not going to kill someone. We will we'll just pray that that you know both can live. I was in a seminary with, with with fellas whose mothers were told, "Oh, if you don't abort this child, you'll die, and your child will die." And they said, "No, I can't do this." And they ended up being born healthy and the mother survived. Okay? I know a number of mothers who were told this. And finally, the, the purpose or intention, okay, it's also called the end of the action. Um, it can be good or evil. Okay? And it can turn, the intention can turn what would be a normally good act into an evil act. If you're intending something bad, I'll give you another example I gave one yesterday. Here's another example. If you give alms, okay, you know what alms giving means? You give money to the poor. Well, if you blow a horn before your, your alms giving, everyone look at me, okay, and your motive is to, to win the praise of others. Uh, Jesus criticized the Pharisees, okay? You choose the places in the synagogue so everyone will see you or look at how holy he is. Well, if this is your motive for alms giving or praying or doing anything, well, this is, you're turning it into a sin. If this is your, your intention, okay, your purpose in doing it, if that's your end in mind, to win praise for yourself. A good act, giving alms, is in itself a good thing, but you've just made it an evil act through your intention. So when we're talking about uh, moral acts, we're talking about all three things have to be good. Okay? The object itself, what it is that's being done, the circumstances surrounding the act, and the intention. And I just want to review again today formal versus material cooperation. Just remember, formal cooperation means you're intending the act be done. You're cooperating with something, fully intending that the act should be done. That's what formal means. You're, you're helping with the act in some way, and you're intending that the action be carried out. So you are responsible then. Like the guy in the getaway car outside of the bank, he can't explain, well, I was just driving the car. Sorry, you're, you're involved in this. You're cooperating with it. You're intending that the bank be robbed. You didn't go in there with a gun, but you are, <clears throat> you're guilty of it. You're going to go to prison if you're caught. And material cooperation is when someone is not, not intending the act be done. However, material cooperation can be sinful or not sinful. That's what I want to spend the rest of your time on today, OK? Material cooperation, you're not proving it. However, it may or may not be simple, sinful depending upon the circumstances whether or not the cooperation is immediate and proximate. Immediate proximate means it's so close to the action 
that even if you're not intending it, you're still guilty. If you're standing next to someone doing an abortion and you're handing them the, the, the tools to do it, well, I'm just a nurse. I'm not intending that this abortion be done. But your, your cooperation is so intertwined with the action, even though you're not intending it, you're doing evil because you're facilitating it. So you can't cooperate even materially. Okay. So um, what we call immediate or proximate cooperation is, is sinful, even though, you're, even though it's material cooperation, even though you're not intending the action to be done. Well, Father, I, you know, how, how will I make money if I don't do this? You'll have to go out and find another job. You can't be assisting the abortionist, handing him the tools to rip babies apart. You can't do this. Because even though you're not intending the abortion to be done, you're making money off this. Your, your cooperation is so close and intimate, so immediate. You can't do this. Now, remote cooperation um, is, do I, do I use that term remote here? Um, Okay, it would be okay, immediate proximate means it's you're, you're, you're assisting it very closely. Okay, remote cooperation, remote material cooperation. Okay. Remote means it's it's not immediate. Okay, you're 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 not intending it. Okay. Okay. I'm not intending the action. And okay, um, your cooperation is, is, is not essential. Okay. Cooperation is, is far removed. Okay. That's what remote means, okay? Far removed from the act itself. So it's not sinful. It's not sinful. Whereas, whereas immediate proximate cooperation is sinful because you're so close to it. Remote material cooperation, they're far removed from it. Okay. An example, okay. um, someone goes in and, and they're hired as a cleaning service to, uh, or you're, you're, say someone's a cleaning lady, she's cleaning a number of buildings, she works for a company, one of them, you're gonna go in and clean um, an abortion building. Okay. Well, I would tell someone who's, who's doing this, um, you should try to get out of it because you don't want anything to do with this, but you're not sinning by, if your boss says, well, you, this is one of the buildings you have to clean. I'd rather not do this. Well, then you'll lose your job. Okay, well, you know, I, I don't like to do this, but I'm not cooperating in this anyway, and my cooperation, you know, cleaning up, uh, you know, mopping the floors or something, is not furthering the abortions being done. It's far removed from the evil act. From the evil act, then she is. From the evil act. So you're not sitting. Although you should try not to do this because it's, it's oh, who wants to go in and clean up after abortion? Uh, I don't know if you saw something horrible. It, it's, you can, if you Google it, you can see it. Um, in British Columbia, they were shipping body parts to, I think it was, the state of Oregon to burn for power, for fuel. Amputated limbs of people and aborted babies. The people in Oregon who were running the power plant said, we didn't know that, I mean, aborted and limbs that are cut off, I mean, you know, there's, there's nothing technically immoral about this, but aborted babies? You're, 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 you're putting aborted babies in incinerators in order to get power? Oh, 
this this went viral. It's, uh, it's, it shows the, the, the evil of, of the whole abortion industry. Um, and and I think it was in Oregon. They said we're, we're not going to accept this anymore. We're not going to do this anymore. And we're not going to accept this this uh, these shipments of human body parts to to uh, and another thing is along with them it was body parts and. and Material, some type of materials, all burning in an incinerator. Well, they said we're not doing this anymore because we didn't know that uh, these were aborted babies that we were burning up to get power. It's, it's horrible. Um, but the people who were shipping it from British Columbia knew this, of course. Anyway, if, if it's remote material cooperation, it's not sinful, but we should still try not to be involved with it because uh, even to give the appearance that we're cooperating in any way with, with something that's evil, we want to stay away from it. So any questions about those principles? Yes? Um, that one story in the news about that guy who wouldn't make a cake for that right. gay couple, yeah. would that be um, material cooperation or would that all? Oh, um, I think it would be remote cooperation. I mean, he's, he's not participating in the wedding in any way for this couple. They wouldn't be participating in this wedding, you know, wanting it to happen. It's remote cooperation, I would say. However, uh, people have a right to follow their own religious beliefs and say, I don't want to cooperate in this. Even though I'm not, I'm not making the wedding or or helping this so-called wedding take place, I don't want anything to do with it because this violates, you know, my conscience. So um, I think the people would be right in saying that. You know, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to be involved in, in, in this in this uh, cake making project, and um, because uh, you know I think what you're doing is wrong. And by us doing it, making you a cake, or photographing you, whatever. Photographing is a little, you're getting a little more close there because uh, a photography, every wedding has you know, photographers. And, and um, you, know, you, you can make an argument there either way, remote or, or immediate cooperation. But still, the person who's, who's doing it, you know, they have a right to say, I don't want anything to do with this. I don't want to, um, I, I don't want to be involved in this. I don't want to cooperate with it in any way as a Christian or even as an atheist. I, I disagree with this. But the courts are forcing me to do it. And I don't know what's going to happen. They, they've closed down, I think, you know, these, these the shops because they just refuse. They say, we're not, we're not doing it. Sorry. We'll close our business. We'll find something else to do. Hobby Lobby is facing that right now because they're going to find them and it's hundreds of dollars a day for every employee because um, they refuse to go along with the, the uh, Affordable Care Act, as it's called. And. Uh